this week, OpenAI released their first open source models in five years, the GBT OSS series. This is after Meta has been doing this for two years with our Llama series, which originally was released in February 2023. Google released Gemma, their open source model, in February of 2024. And OpenAI has finally caught up with the curve. Anthropic has not, but we can talk about that in a different video. The advent of more open source models invites more democratization of AI systems. It means that everyone can play with these enormous models, can build on them, can potentially commercialize the work that they do in a larger effort to increase innovation, make things more accessible. And there are no downsides. If you've been to my channel, you know better. Because what we don't talk about is that these models are still built on the entire internet. And that complicates things a bit. At the same time, open source is a legitimately good thing. So let's figure out how we square those two, if we can. In January of 2025 of this year, Sam Altman admitted that OpenAI had been on the wrong side of history as it related to open source models. Essentially, they did a full 180 announcing that OpenAI was working on open source versions of their GPT models and would be releasing them later that year. But what did they do a 180 from? It's a company called OpenAI. You would think that open source is a big thing for them. In 2020, they did release GPT-2 as an open source model. They got praise for their transparency. And then for five years, they just didn't release anything open source afterwards. We had GPT-3, we had GPT-4, we had the reasoning models. Nothing, nada, nothing happened. Everything locked down proprietary. In the interim, Meta released their initial Llama model in February 2023. Google released Gemma, which is their open source version of the Gemini models, and Hugging Face, which is a company that was started in 2016, but has definitely blown up over the last few years as AI open source models have grown more popular and more accessible, became kind of the GitHub of AI models. But OpenAI didn't pivot anything during that five-year period. In fact, what likely got them to change their minds, what likely got Sam Altman to change his mind, was DeepSeek. DeepSeek is a company that does AI research. You likely know them because they released an open source reasoning model that claims to have been trained on older technology with less uh, energy usage than pretty much any other major U.S. company. That was released in December 2024 when it came to the open source model, January 2025 as it related to the app and the desktop version. The app ended up shooting well past ChatGPT on the iOS tier list. And coincidentally, a few weeks later, Sam Altman says that OpenAI has been on the wrong side of history and that they believe in open source now. And then by August 2025, only seven and change months later, we have the GPT OSS series that are released under a license that allows you to use it, build on it, share it commercialize it as you see fit. Here's the problem. What companies call open source in the context of AI models is not what that term originally meant. And that probably matters more than you think. If we're going to get like chapter and verse about it, open source code for a program or a tool that you're making is made freely available to the public for modification, redistribution. You may or may not commercialize on it, but you attribute things to people. The term originated in the late 1990s, around the time that I was born, 96. In response to this idea of free software, software that you can use for free, but where you don't have access to the actual code, the actual tool that lies behind the scenes, you just have access to the outputs. You can interact with it, but you can't build on it. And so the key idea here was that if you're going to make your systems open source, you should share your code such that other developers can build on it, modify it, contribute back, credit you in the process. In other words, the idea was that I share my work with the larger community, you credit me, and then ideally you contribute back and we build amazing things together. There are a bunch of examples of manifestations of this. Linux is one, Firefox is another, PyTorch, a lot of different machine learning libraries are big ones. Then we get AI. So the idea of open source is built on code. It's built on sharing code, it's built on sharing 
methods, the behind the scene things that result in the output. And AI models aren't just code. Uh, in fact, the important part of them is often the data. Most open source models when it comes to AI are just open weights. It is the weights that go with the architecture of the model. I'll link something up here that will give a deeper dive into this, but weights are the learned patterns that a model derives statistically from training data. And when we talk about open source AI, what we're talking about is just those weights. In other words, it's like getting the finished like cake, but you don't get the recipe, the ingredients, or the instructions. In fact, the open source initiative, one of the bodies that I wouldn't say regulates, but overseas speaks to these things, had to create completely new definitions of open source when it came to AI because it did not fit into the framework at all. And this is because in traditional open source, every line of code can be traced back to the person who made it. But in AI training, you have massive data sets from millions to billions of people. It becomes this AI slop, AI soup situation. And it also means that artists or other people, writers, whatever, can see their exact style being replicated, but don't get any sort of credit or any sort of compensation from it. This is native to the entire situation when you use ChatGPT, Claude, whatever. You are leveraging the work of other people. And under open source, if you're just sharing the weights, it means that, particularly in the context of major AI companies, Someone else outside of that company can continue to commercialize the work that you did without having to credit you or attribute it to your work, largely because they can't. There's no way with only the weights for them to unravel the content that came from a particular person or particular artist, even if they wanted to. I do think that a great example of this challenge was in 2024, last year, when Meta essentially announced that all public Instagram posts would be used to change their AI. As people who live outside of the U.S. seem to consistently be very surprised by, in the U.S. we don't have consumer data protection laws, so all you could do was private your account. If you live in the EU or the U.K., you have GDPR, uh, which does allow you to opt out. But particularly if you're an artist, it does mean that you don't have much of a choice in your work being kind of fed into the wood shipper. At the same time, there were a ton of copyright lawsuits filed against a bunch of AI companies. Some of them were class action uh, brought together by artists. The ones that will likely move the needle more are the ones from Disney and Universal. But as with all things when it comes to AI, the underlying question is, who actually gets democratized here? Most AI models that we're looking at right now were built on tools like PyTorch, uh, were built on tools like Keras, TensorFlow, which are all open source machine learning libraries that nobody pays to use. They are the backbone of how these companies profit off of AI. The companies would not have started if it weren't for open source machine learning libraries. And so to then turn around and say, we took this work that the community built and we built our own commercialized stuff on it. And we also took work that the public created that they did not consent to being used for this and built our company on that. And now we're returning the weights of it to you as a gift that you should be happy about. But it is in their interest at the end of the day. 73% of Fortune 500 companies essentially depend on open source AI models at this point. They are more secure. They allow for fine tuning that can incorporate proprietary confidential company data without having to worry about APIs. Most of these companies are also arguing that they can use all this stuff under the guise of fair use. I'm not going to get into that because I'm not a lawyer. America does not run on Duncan. It runs on Vibes. And Vibes are a social contract. The social contract of traditional open source was opt-in collaboration between willing participants who could opt out at any time where people credited each other and, and that was the norm. And now we have open source AI models, which function in a lot of ways as kind of mass appropriation of content with these retroactive social contracts that no one actually signed, but we're all supposed to be okay with. Here's what I'll say. I do still think that open source is great. I think that it's something that we should lean into more. It's it's something very academic, although we could get into like open access publishing, which would also be a whole 
different video. It's something I'd love to see more investment in, more kind of coalition building around, particularly as it relates to people like you. You're probably not someone who's a developer, but you might be interested in this tech and you might feel like the barrier to entry is super high because you don't have a massive computer that can run the weights of GPT OSS. And I totally get that because neither do I. But I'd love to see us take things like these models and actually democratize them in a way that meets what that word means. When Sam Altman says that OpenAI was on the wrong side of history, I'm wondering what history he's talking about. The question isn't whether models should be open source. It's whether we can create a version of open source AI that actually serves everyone and ideally disproportionately does not serve the companies that made the model. But that's not an easy question to answer. It's actually something I've been thinking about a lot lately because I've been thinking of developing a course that would essentially be like values-based AI 101. So I'd love to get feedback on what you'd like to see. And in fact, the timing could not be better because Teachable, who is sponsoring this video, reached out to me literally about a week after I started sketching out ideas for this guide to AI tool strategy. Teachable is where seasoned creators build lasting businesses through education. Whether you're relaunching your signature course, selling digital downloads, offering coaching, or creating a membership, Teachable gives you multiple ways to turn your knowledge into reliable, scalable income. Now, it's literally my job to delve deep into these models, as you can see from this video, but if you don't have time to spend weeks figuring out the optimal prompts and still find yourself struggling with a blank page, that is where Teachable's AI Hub comes in. Their AI course starter can draft your full curriculum, content structure, and even sales page in minutes. And it doesn't just create generic content, it gives you a thoughtful framework build on and helps you dial in on what you actually want your students to learn instead of just leaving you staring at nothing. Personally, it helped me get past that initial where do I even start curdle, then layer in all of the nuanced stuff that you can't get from AI alone. Things like real world testing, the specific prompt strategies that actually work, and mistakes that I've made so you don't have to. Plus, by making an online course, you're making your knowledge more accessible. Teachable can transcribe in over 70 languages. Teachable can transcribe in over 70 languages, which expands your impact even more. I've teamed up with Teachable so that my followers can get a 30-day extended free trial. So click the link in the description to start creating something that genuinely impacts people. And like I said, feel free to leave a comment down below or, I don't know, DM me on Insta, TikTok, whatever. My handles are here. Uh, if you'd be interested in a course like this, other things you'd want to hear about, because I think this would be fun. I don't know. These are things I love to talk about, obviously. That's why I have a YouTube channel. And otherwise, I'll see y'all in the next one. Bye.